Opa. Can you hear me? There you are. Yes, yes, yes. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. That's great. We'll give a 30, 30 seconds. We we'll let some people to jump in. And we start in two minutes. Uh, or one minute. All right. Can you see me okay? Very good. Very well. See the honor academic college? <laughs> oh my God. What is Evie Levy? Let's see. Uh, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to go in after the loss yesterday, but it doesn't matter. We don't talk about it today. We'll keep it for another day. Um, I think we we can start, Mitch. People will jump in if they want. 8.30, it's 8.33. So first of all, I'm first, I'm excited like it's my bar mitzvah, you know, it's where I don't get to see you like this on, on call. Maybe, maybe you can call. do your bar mitzvah portion uh, again. Well, uh, well, I don't <laughs> Oh my God. But uh, here we are in the own academic college and i um, really excited to have you. First of all, hey, everybody, dear students, friends. Like I said, I'm very excited to have, uh, to have you here. A very good friend, dear friend of mine, until we get to the tennis court or squash court. And then we become, he's becoming my biggest enemy. <laughs> my biggest enemy. Nobody knows the, the fights we have. We're smiling until we get on court. So Mitch, Mitch Golder, ladies and gentlemen, for everybody, for sure, you know, and you heard, and uh, thank you very much for being here, and um, obviously. It's good um, to be here. Nice to see you. We, we're going to talk a lot today. Um, we're going to talk about your personal life a little bit, about business, your business, about, obviously, um, we're going to talk about uh, Apol Hadera. No, <laughs> we're going to talk about... <laughs> Um, obviously, Maccabi Tel Aviv, the theme uh, that you own. And so let's have fun, let's start. Um, and uh, yeah, first of all, Mitch, you know, everybody know you, Mitch Goldar, Maccabi Tel Aviv. And, uh, but what I would really want to start with is uh, your personal story, you know? I want to like, I want to hear like your background, um, the family you, you were growing up into, like you're coming from a wealthy family or, you know, you grew up by yourself and how you develop and get into the real estate world. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. And it's great to be here. And, uh, and yes, you're right. We, uh, we have a great uh, rivalry. It's not really a rivalry. Don't talk about it. <laughs> because, uh, because there's no contest on the, squash, on the tennis court, but we'll talk about the squash court later. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like I grew up in a wealthy family. It wasn't uh, wealthy financially. We, uh, I was a simple kid. Um, I'm in the middle of, you know, I'm an older brother and younger sister. I mean, uh, my parents... Uh, you know, we're married very young. Um, uh, they're still married. Uh, they're still independent living in Toronto. They've been married for over 60 years. And uh, in a lot of ways, you know, our upbringing was, I mean, um, in some ways so not uh, extraordinary, you know, because um, I would say normal, uh, but, but, but no, no, no upbringing is normal. Everybody's got their they're interesting, you know, uh, things going on. But for me, I was a real su simple kid. Uh, I was a happy kid. I uh, played sports. I, I just had a lot of interest in, in sports and, you know, and being outside and being physical. And I live in Canada. We live in Canada. So, you know, it's cold. And my mom could never keep me keep me inside. I mean, I think at some point my mom, my mom uh, got a whistle. Uh, you know, to, to, to whistle to, to, cause I would go out and I would be gone when, you know, after school, I didn't really like school. Um, cause I couldn't really enjoy, uh, sitting there for hours on end, but, but I loved after school. And then my mom would have a whistle to try and get me to come back for dinner. I mean, I would need dinner. Like I would, I would just keep doing sports. Um, I could have ended up anywhere. I could have ended up on the other end of the city. Uh, if somebody, you know, had a game, 
another game and another game, you know, hockey or, or, or you know, whatever it is. So, um, but we weren't wealthy. My, my dad, he did not finish uh, high school. Um, he uh, dropped out early. Um, my mom, she didn't go to university. Um, my dad, yeah, he was just a, you know, hardworking, you know, smart, you know, street smart, um, tough uh, guy uh, who came home every day for dinner, you know, and, um, you know, got up early and, um, you know, made his way by his wits. Um, so we grew up around that. He was also very skeptical, I'd say almost cynical guy, you know. So I grew up around, you know, this idea that the world was a tough place and um, nothing comes easy and nothing works out properly. Uh, so I sort of evolved into having my own, I guess, philosophy that things that go right are really just a series of things that don't go wrong, you know, and that you, you, need, to, you need to proactively, uh, you know, anticipate things going wrong. So do something to prevent something from going wrong, not to wait for it to go wrong. You know, this is sort of the mentality that I think I grew up around. Um, and, uh, but not money, no, not poor. No, we didn't need anything. I didn't care about anything material. I didn't even know there was anything material to, to care about. <laughs> you know, I could have lived in a, you know, a, like, a, like a, an RV. If we lived in a trailer park, I would have been fine. So long as there was a ball to kick or hit or throw, um, I couldn't care less. I mean, I think I wore the same pair of jeans every single day in grade nine to, to school. I, I think my mother used to wash them overnight. Like, I didn't care about, you know, material things. So how so did you get into, how did you get to the real estate type business? How did you get into like suddenly from playing sports? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it was really a combination of the fact that my, my dad was in uh, floor coverings, you know, carpet and tile business. We used to go to his uh, warehouse, you know, a little tiny warehouse. And uh, then eventually, like a lot of trades, he was a trade really, um, he got into real estate with his, with his partners. They bought a piece of land and they bought another piece of land. So I was around it. Um, they were sort of old school subdividers, uh, subdividers of land. But, you know, as I said, I was sort of, um, you know, kind of like, um, I kept things pretty simple. So my dad was, was around, was in real estate and the people that he was friends with were in real estate. So I was around real estate. And I guess it also happened that I got, I got into competitive sports when I was young. And one of the sports being tennis at the time was very popular, like worldwide. And so, you know, a lot of successful people who I thought were giants in, in, in real estate were, were into tennis. And so I met them, you know, I would meet them because they'd want, like, you know, they want to play with, uh, with a good tennis player. So I used to meet all these real estate people, you know, um, you know, through tennis. So I just thought very early on, you know, I liked real estate. I kind of understood the language. You know, it's like if my dad was a pilot, you know, you know, you kind of grow up around, you know, in the cockpit, you know, even if it's, it doesn't matter what kind of a plane it is, you kind of feel what a plane feels like. You, you, you smell the smells, you feel the vibrations, you, you understand the movements and it's just inherent in Jinnet. And so you develop a circuitry for, for, for something. And that for me was real estate, even though I was not an academic, um, both real estate or business. I mean, I never went to business school. So I always just thought, you know, I want to go into real estate. You know, I want to go into business. I want to go into real estate. Let's get this school stuff over with. You know, I kind of liked my friends in school, but I wanted to get into real estate early. And so in my mind, in my teenage years, I was already kind of in real estate, working around my father and other people. So um, it just happened so naturally. It was everything was a natural next step. I mean, everything is a process, one small step after another. And next thing I knew, I was in my early 20s. And I was looking for real estate to, to buy, even though I didn't have any money. <laughs> so how did you buy? Oh, I mean, what, 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 made you, what, what made you actually, or what makes you um, such a great businessman? You know, you start such an early age without money. And... I think, uh, you know, 
it's a combination of things. I mean, uh, there must be, I guess there must be something in Jinnet, you know, everybody who, who succeeds at something must have something in Jinnet. But, you know, I was a determined kid, you know, I was absolutely determined. Like there was nobody who was going to stop me uh, from being successful in business. Like, you know, just not going to happen. I, I just knew I wanted to be successful. Um, and so I got up early and so worked hard and I developed my own work ethics. I mean, I love my friends and everything, but they would, you know, party and they would, you know, use their twenties, you know, late teens and twenties to have, you know, just, they put off their start of their career. And I, I was like, you know, I, I went to bed early. I got up early. I worked, you know, and I tried to learn things. And I don't know, I, I always felt like everything was details, you know, and that there are no big things. I don't know why I always believed that it was only, there are only details. So I was always massively focused on details. So I would practice focusing and focusing my intellect uh, on details. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I've come to, you know, believe in that even more so um, that, you know, people who are successful are focused on details that you never graduate from focusing on details. If you do, you are living dangerously. But if you go into the office of a very you know, successful person, I think what you'll find is that they're, they're, they're focused on a uh, um, whole bunch of details. I was doing that at a young age and I used every minute, like I wanted to get 60 seconds, 60 seconds out of every minute in my late teens and early twenties. So by the time I was in my, early mid 20s, I was already sort of comfortable in the real estate game. And I, I, th I thought I'd never met anybody yet who could stop me from, you know, from, you know, succeeding at, you know, at developing a pro you know, I was in real estate development in developing a property, even though I may have been wrong. Um, but it got me exposed to a lot of people. And I got to watch a lot of successful people make mistakes. I got to listen to a lot of successful people and I got to learn from a lot of uh, successful people um, at a young age. So I feel like that was a huge advantage for me. All right. Tell me now, I've been to Canada lots of times, obviously visiting you. I know how many places you have, uh, Maccabi here, all over the world, places, businesses. How do you keep control of so many successful businesses, you know, all together? So many locations, like, I want to know, like, give us a... You know, an example of a typical day at the office. Mitch Golder, typical day at the office. So many locations. How do you keep yeah. all of it? I mean, first of all, there is always multiples more to do than there is time to do it. So you live with this. You come to be uh, comfortable with this being uncomfortable. But there's always things that are live bullets that, you know, you couldn't deal with. Um, so, I mean, but I think that's the anatomy of any, any growing business, that there's always more to do than there is time to do it. So you learn to live with that and tolerate it and also be able to go to bed at night knowing that's normal. Um, I mean, it's almost like if you had, you know, I, you, know you have kids, uh, you know, like if you, you have, if you have 100 kids, you know, arguably you could laugh and say, you know, how do you keep track of all your kids? But you would keep track of all your kids. You, you'd give, you'd have, they'd come into the world one at a time. You'd go through, uh, you know, a huge amount, a huge ordeal, you know, uh, them coming into the world and every single day they'd have needs. And every single day you would do your best to address their needs. And then you had a second and a third and then a 20, you know, for me in business, it's almost like that. Um, that, uh, you know, each one have their needs, you care about them more than anybody. I think that's one of the uh, qualities of an owner. And, um, and you just keep getting up earlier and earlier and staying later and later. And of course, you kind of if you do everything properly up front, I'm a bit of a pay forward guy, like I believe in, in, in doing things, you know, with a long term view, always, that eventually that long term view really does start to kick in for you. It creates its own momentum. And eventually, you know, you can do more because you did everything sort of, you know, in a certain way up front. And so after time, you know, each one of these, say in your example, you know, projects have their own momentum. You know, they should be structured in a way 
that they're they should stay in the air. If it was an airplane, you know, it's it's built to fly in heavy weather. You know, you don't put it up in the air until it's built to fly in heavy weather. And so when there's heavy weather, yeah, you have to pay more attention to it, but it was built originally for heavy weather. And that's what I sort of do and have done. Um, but yeah, it's all about getting up early and staying late. There's a lot of sacrifices. I mean, I gave up a lot. I missed a lot of birthdays, a lot of um, parties, um, you know, I missed you know, a lot of things, but that's something that I didn't miss. I mean, uh, now talking about, I mean, the business, uh, and you achieved so much really in business. I mean, we all know. And um, where do you find the motivation? I mean, how, where? I mean, in doing so much more business and waking up in the morning, you achieved so much. And waking up in the morning and another one and another one. Where do you find yeah. this motivation from? I mean, I find it is um, self-perpetuating motivation. I mean, first of all, I think you really only have to be good at one thing, you know, in, in, in to have a, you know, a um, fulfilling life. You know, I, I think you really just need to be good at one thing and, um, and maybe have one hobby that you love. And, you know, and one significant other in your life. Like it's, you don't need to have, you know, you're chasing ghosts all over the place. And for me, you know, I like, and you know, it makes me feel alive to solve the problems and use my, my mind, my, my head, you know, to solve these puzzles. You know, this is to me being alive. You know, I don't think of it as, uh, I, I mean, I, mean I, 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 you know, it, you know, my life is enhanced actually by waking up and solving these problems um, because every day that's what ends up coming to me are the problems you know the things that are going right I, you know they don't come to me I, I deal with all the problems and I feel alive solving them or trying to I mean it's an attempt at mastering something that you can never master but um, but you uh, but you are you know you know you're, you're existing you know by just doing that and I I believe that that is living like that to me that is living I don't think of it as leading to something you know that you get as a result of doing that I think that is the prize I think the prize is to be able to use your intellect to solve problems and then of course if there's financial benefits you can enjoy those personally because of your own achievements and so you're the captain of your own ship and the locus of your self-worth is internal not external and it start the starting point really is um, you know having a long-term approach to everything you do trying to do things properly in the long term committing to it you know um, sacrificing getting up early and staying late uh, it also has to do with other things you know you have to you have to you know have respect for other people you have to um, 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 you know, you have to believe everyone's equal. You know, these things have to be there inside you. People will, you know, have to respond. You need to like people. You need to be able to be tough with people. You know, you need to be able to tolerate being alone, you know, and unpopular. These are all things that are sort of, I'm not saying that are part of it, but um, I think most people are up for the task if they have the right roadmap. Like, I don't think I'm, you know, I, I think it's just having the right book, the right roadmap to, to be able to do what I do or what I've done or some, some variation on what I've done. I, want to I think just that. a lot of people aren't, aren't willing to do it. A lot of people want you know, quick windfalls. They want shortcuts. Uh, their idea of success is, uh, is getting something fast. I, I don't, um, in fact, I, I don't think I would ever take anything. If I could, if I could suddenly get a windfall, get something for nothing, I, I'd give it back. Um, I think I was always, always like that. It's like when I play you in, uh, <laughs> I was waiting you know, for when that. I you, uh, when, you know, when I'm playing you in tennis and you're giving me some generous, you know, call, I don't want it, you know, it's like, I want to earn it. Uh, I want, I want, but I want you know, when, when we play squash and I give you some good calls, you do, you take it, which is. Exactly. Take everything, everything until I beat you one day. Don't worry. <laughs> one day it will come. <laughs> but. Talking about now a little bit, uh, changing subjects, still business, COVID-19. By the way, 
I got my second vaccine yesterday. So this side of my face is like, you see, nothing oh, wrong. Boy. It's just a little yeah, bit. Yeah. <laughs> I have, did you get, I have did you get your vaccine? Already. Did you get your vaccine? No, no. Not yet. Oh my God, Mitch, we, 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 it. oh my God. Yeah, yeah no, we have had uh, a little bit of a slower um, ramp up on the vaccine, unfortunately, in, in Canada. Wow. Uh, it's, it's uh, no, I have not had it. And I don't know anyone other oh than healthcare workers. I don't know anyone who's had it. Yeah, Israel is, Israel is in the news. In Israel. Canada, we'll, lot, we'll get yeah. you in Israel, we have, we have plenty. We don't know what to yeah. do with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're throwing well, thousands every day. I'm going to give Canada a little bit more more time, but anyway, but co I, Corona, I, I, yeah. and I guess uh, really for for many years your business were growing nicely and very unbelievable successful. How did you survive this uh, last crazy times? You know, this year. So I guess it was a crazy year. Yeah, I mean it's a crazy year for sure. Um, you know, and we've got a lot of uh, retail. So what did you learn from this year? I mean. Well, I mean, I told you before at the beginning, you know, things that go right are really just the series of things that don't go wrong. So I've always sort of planned for, um, you know, for things to go wrong. And I, I, I guess, yeah, I, I kind of feel like you never know what it's going to be. But if you look at history, there's always something uh, that nobody can predict will happen. The only thing you can predict is that you can't predict it but it will happen. And I'm not going to list the things that have gone wrong like COVID in, you know, in, in the world in terms of economic implications, um, but it's inevitable. So I always, I told you, I grew up a little bit, you know, sort of, you know, on the one hand, very, you know, determined and, and, and optimistic, but also skeptical. So, I mean, my company is built for, you know, for the worst case scenario. So we're in good shape because we have low levels of debt. At the end of the day, you know, debt really is the dangerous aspect of business. And, um, you know, and I always did my leases with Walmart and food stores and Home Depot. And there's a company in Canada called Canadian Tire, which is kind of like a, a specialty more, you know, it's a, it's a strong company like Walmart. And so the majority of our, our centers are, are occupied by by Walmart basically, and of course, you know they're not just paying the rent; they're they're thriving uh, for you know unfortunate reasons, but uh, but it's an essential service. So the business has very strong um, um, you know operating income, uh, even though it's difficult times. Um, but but simultaneously, retail is shrinking because because of e-commerce. And, and obviously temporarily with, with COVID. And so for the last five or six years, we have been endeavoring on a, a, a program to um, build residential and seniors homes and storage actually, um, and some office, uh, not so much on our property. So we are naturally shrinking our retail uh, footprint and building on our own sites that we already own. We don't have to buy the land. We already own the land. And our sites are flat with big parking lots. So it's easy to build an apartment building or a condo. So we're building, I mean, we have now a uh, program which is public information that is about $12 billion Canadian dollars um, of development on sites across the country. And it's well underway. I mean, so the company is transitioning from being retail, primarily retail only to slowly but surely, um, um, you know, residential and, and some of the other things I mentioned. I mean, and so, how, do you, how do you think it's going to change the world? I mean, we were talking a bit, looking into the yeah, future. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's hard to imagine now. I think the world will probably look a lot like it used to look. That's my personal opinion. You know, don't listen to me. I don't know, you know, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball, but I kind of feel like, um, you know, we got where, where we were before for reasons, you know, everybody is complicit in all the decisions we make that resulted in where we were before. And it has a lot to do with the human condition and, um, you know, family structures and other economic realities. I would say that um, there will be some permanent changes 
Uh, they're sort of predictable, but for the most part, I think a lot of it will look similar. Um, some of the things that were changing already and everything's always changing uh, are accelerated for sure. And those may be permanent, but um, um, you know, the big question is, will people return to offices and work in offices and will the, the demand for offices be um, equal to the supply of offices and things like that? Initially, I don't think it will be. I mean, I would say that there will be some companies that will push very hard to work with less office space. Um, I think in part because you know, they think uh, they're not sure, they think that's the way of the future and, and they can save some money. But um, I think in part, it's a bit of a, um, uh, like I think there's a bit of a herd mentality right now. I think it's, it's kind of the thing to say. I think it's the thing to say and sound relevant. I, I'm not sure that's gonna survive. Um, the long, the long term. Um, so, uh, but I, I think uh, I think the next few years there will be more supply than demand for office space, for example. Um, but I think the world will drift back mostly to you know, plus or minus where we were um, pre-COVID in in the next few years. This is a question Arel wanted me to ask you. So, should we invest in your stock? No, just kidding. <laughs> 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 Don't get me started. Yeah. No inside information. Yes, Andy, go buy, buy, buy. <laughs> I I invest in my stock, so uh, I have a lot of it um, already. You couldn't uh, say more. That's it. it. So um, you can, um, you can do whatever you understand. What you want. <laughs> now, I guess most of the people here in the Academy College of Honor, Sports uh, students and management and. Obviously, they're very interested in hearing uh, what you have to say about sports, club, managing, Maccabi Tel Aviv. So we're going to start talking a little bit about uh, your favorite team in the world, Maccabi Tel Aviv. Um, I got to ask you, I have to ask, I have to start with the first question. Everybody's looking now, he's going to ask a silly niche. No, no, everybody's like, wait. First question, Mitch, please. What made you invest in a football club in Israel? Why did you choose Maccabi Tel Aviv? Ah, you have so many teams, Betar, you have so many teams. <laughs> no, yeah. Did you, did you, uh, you, you, know, um, you know, obviously, look at, I grew up, I grew up in a Jewish home. Uh, my mom, my mom is a, uh, you know, childhood survivor, Holocaust survivor. Um, I guess, you know, I, I love sports. I mean, you know, I, I, um, I, I, I'm a sports guy. Um, and, you know, at a moment in time, Maccabi Tel Aviv FC was, I differentiate obviously, was in some financial um, uh, stress. Um, I, had, I had known Israel, I would come to Israel regularly uh, for various reasons. And I just knew it as a tourist. I mean, you know, even though, yeah, I was tired of of, uh, of Israel as a tourist. You know, um, I couldn't crack uh, I couldn't crack the facade. Um, no matter how many times I came to Israel, uh, and yeah, I guess I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm not into facades. I wanted to to be a little bit uh, more um, like I wanted to take in the real, you know, Israel. And, um, and then this came along, you know, I wasn't interested, I, I was dabbling in, in, in doing business in Israel, like, you know, real estate, actually, before buying Maccabi, I was looking at, uh, at actually, you know, developing real estate in Israel. Uh, I won't go into details, maybe another time when more time passes, but uh, I would tell you some of the interesting things that were almost going to happen in in Israel um, through this um, uh, you know, initiative. But then I guess uh, for a variety of reasons um, that I chose not to do the, in, you know, the real estate uh, development in Israel. And, uh, but I still wanted to, uh, to, to be more involved. So, um, you know, then I looked at Maccabi and it was in financial difficulty. To me, it was a, is a, a, an icon. Uh, in sports, but also it's a represent a rep representative of the Jewish people in Europe, as well as uh, 
I think it's a good, um, you know, it's a, it's a very powerful um, um, role model for kids as well. Um, and, um, and I thought it was a new and interesting challenge that involved me in sports and Israel at the same time and tied back to my, my, mother's, my mother's history. And, uh, and so um, after a lot of, you know, saying no, actually, and a lot of, uh, you know, thinking hard about it, I did ultimately uh, see something. There was, you know, a moment. There was a mysterious moment of, of, of birth when I said, okay, this, this dog could hunt. This, this project could work. Um, and I'm interested in trying to, you know, to, I'm interested in taking it on. And that's when, um, you know, I finally called the guys back and said, okay, let's, uh, let's explore this idea of, of acquiring Maccabi Tel Aviv. And, um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It's been a, it's been a, um, fantastic experience. So we continue if we're talking about Maccabi, obviously, and I have to ask you, what is your philosophy as far as managing a football club? If, uh, do you have a, a football club in Europe, US, Canada, which is a role model for you? Coming like from a statistic. Now, one of the things we are laughing about is me and you, you, you learn one word in Hebrew, friar. Everybody thinks friar, which is a friar. <laughs> yeah. What is your yeah. philosophy as far as managing a football club? Yeah. Well, look at when I bought the team. I mean, um, you know, I, I I heard that word a lot actually. Um, <laughs> spending, but, you know, spending. It's funny. It, it, I, maybe it should have bothered me. Um, you know, I don't know more. I, it didn't bother me. I thought it was just funny, really, that they thought that you know whatever you know I was doing was so you know it was so uh, uh, was so naive or something, but. Um, yeah, I mean, most of it comes from just my general uh, approach, I think, of a long-term approach. Like, I think there is only, you know, the lo long-term is the only approach there is. I mean, there's lots of short-term benefits to a long-term approach as well. Um, but, um, so yeah, I mean, I strongly believe in work ethic. Um, I just don't understand, uh, a lot, you know, a philosophy of trying to get out of work. Like, I don't get it. I, I don't get why people value leisure time so much. I mean, and that probably seems so funny to hear. I mean, some people may think, well, isn't that self-evident? I mean, it's leisure time, but, you know, honestly, I think we live in a very superficial, very spoiled part of the world. And I don't mean Israel per se in terms of geography, but I just mean, you know, you know um, I just feel that's a very spoiled and, um, and uh, uh, superficial approach to life. I think work uh, offers way more than leisure time. And um, it, you know, it, it, it offers all the things that I was saying earlier. And I think we're made to work. I think we're designed to work. And I think we feel funny when we're not working. We try and make it seem like we're happy and we're not sure exactly, you know, I'm happy, right? Like I've got all, you know, my leisure time. I don't uh, buy it. Like I think, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, you know, learning and, and achieving. And I don't mean that. I mean that beyond the cliche. I mean, I mean, getting, you know, being good at something, you know, and being getting better at something and pushing yourself and uh, is living life. And that's feeling alive. And you also reap the benefits because so few people are willing to do it that you get even further ahead because everybody's trying to get off the highway. Everyone's trying to get out of work. And um, so I think applying that to Maccabi is one, you know, you know one, one thing that I do apply to Maccabi. I have no tolerance for corner cutting. Um, and uh, so I you know, like to think that we have a culture and are still building a culture with a work ethic similar to what I'm describing, as well as everybody is small. Nobody is bigger than anyone. No one is better than anyone. And the fact is that that's just true. Just like it's true that people are you know, happier when they work and when they're when they're achieving. Um, people are not better than other people, and uh, so I feel strongly at Maccabi that there's a no tolerance for anybody that that thinks they're bigger than the club or bigger than the game. Um, so you know, those are examples of of of, of two or three 
uh, things that um, that are guiding principles that I live by and work by that, uh, that Maccabi also lives by, um, along with other things. There's lots of other rules and regulations and processes and procedures at Maccabi that are absolutely um, uh, not negotiable if you want to be at Maccabi. Um, having said that, you will also enjoy the benefits. You'll be treated with respect. You will, you will uh, be on a, a team that you'll feel very close to. You'll feel alive. You'll be the best you can be. And hopefully the results will look after themselves. So this is, I mean, this is my next question I wanted to ask. What kind of changes were important for you to make when you bought Maccabi? So I guess those are the changes. Huh? <laughs> Would you tell me yeah. some of them? Or? No, no, I won't. But okay. I will tell you that there were lots of changes to be made. But I mean, you know, uh, you know, that's just my my approach. You know, the, the, the next person will have their approach and someone else will have their approach. I mean, you know, uh, that's just my approach. And so, yeah, there were changes. This approach, I mean, it's, uh, it's similar, like managing your businesses and managing a football club. You don't say Absolutely. anything. Absolutely. For sure. Yes. It's a long term approach for every decision and um, um, and tolerating, you know, you know, short term criticism and uh, whatever it may be, uh, you know, being called, you know, a friar or, or, or not, you know, immediately seeing, you know, immediate results. I mean, we had to deal with certain things in the short term, um, but ultimately it all is a, a, a long term approach to, to running uh, the organization. Um, you know, with all the decisions we're making, it's all about building a proper culture and uh, take a long-term approach to, um, you know, to, to, to running the football club. Now people, I mean, for sure, everybody asks, I, I ask myself this question, Maccabi is so successful and it seems like everything is peaceful and quiet and they work well. Being far from Israel and the team, do you find it challenging? How involved are you in like teams managing, like in the decisions and like, how involved are you in teams? Because I know you, but I want you to hear from like, I, when I come to Canada, I see your passion and watching the games. I mean, how involved are you? Look, at, you know, I'm not in Israel right now. We're on a, we're on a, a Zoom call. Uh, you know, there's, it's very easy to be close from far away. And, um, you know, I care. Wait, it doesn't everything. mean when you come to Israel, you're not going to come to Ono Academy College uh, to see me studying, you know, and throwing the head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to see this. Yeah, like no, this. I will be there. Oh, no, I, I, I will be there for sure. I want to see this with my own eyes. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I mean, uh, I'm very involved. I mean, I enjoy it. I don't have involvement in, in businesses that I don't enjoy. I mean, you know, I, I do them because I enjoy them, but it doesn't mean that they're easy and the distance is not ideal, but we make up for it in many ways. We're used to it at this point already. We've been doing it for 10 or 11 years, for goodness sakes. Um, and, uh, you know, we do have a culture and there was a lot of pay forward and the people that are at Maccabi are like-minded, you know, there's a, when in doubt, we have another meeting. When in doubt, we have a meeting. When in doubt, another meeting. I mean, um, so, um, you know, and choosing people that are like-minded is very important. People with long-term approach, people who walk the walk and, you know, who represent the Maccabi uh, philosophy and culture are very important. And uh, so with great people, I mean, think about how many great people are involved in Maccabi and my business, by the way, in, in Canada. Everybody I mean, except Moran, great people, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I wish I could take a shot. Uh, I will see if I can, but Moran's been fantastic, actually. Uh, just fantastic. Uh, he's, come been, on. he's been there, he's been there, he's a great, great guy. But I will say, you know, look at Jack, you know, Jack uh, has been uh, now uh, for so many years, and and of course, um, um, you know the the management staff in the office. So many uh, long term, uh, um, you know, colleagues. Uh, they're a huge part of it. You know, uh, Sharon, and uh, uh, you know, as you know, um, and and even our decision making on coaches and coaching team you know we put a lot of time and effort in up front so that when the, you know the decision is made that these individuals are given the trust and responsibility to do their job I don't phone up and say look at um, I'm concerned about this player or that player or you know this uh, 
um, in a lineup. Um, I believe in the coaches um, until they, you know, lose my confidence. But uh, but the intention is going in to find somebody who, and uh, you know, who's who I have confidence in, and I give them that that uh, you know that I give them that full confidence until they've lost that confidence. And once the confidence is lost after giving them absolutely. Uh, you know, you know, all the opportunities and, uh, you know, uh, that are reasonable, um, then, 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 and only then, then we need to make a thoughtful change. Uh, so, you know, these are examples of how and why, you know, I can be in Canada and still be, you know, on top of Maccabi. I mean, what are your goals with Maccabi? And obviously the question, how long are you planning to stay more? If you're planning to stay more, are you staying more? <laughs> you know, uh, first of all, the first the first thing is we've got so much to achieve. I, I am, you know, truthfully, I'm not happy with where we are. Um, and uh, um, we, we, we have work to do in, in, in a number of areas. I mean, I could, I could spend time talking about the things that we are doing well and we are, we have achieved. But I'm more focused on some of the uh, elusive uh, things that we are still not doing right and doing well. Um, so I'm excited about, I really am determined to get, um, you know, the rest of the original um, uh, vision um, achieved at Maccabi. Uh, we've come a long way, don't get me wrong. Uh, and I'm not going to stay just to achieve those goals. How long are you going to stay? You're going to stay for your own? I stay long, so long, long as, stay, stay as long as I'm, uh, so long as I'm having fun, so long as I'm enjoying it, you know, in its personal enjoyment. It doesn't mean, um, you know, rah-rah enjoyment. It means internal, you know, um, it's an internal enjoyment, you know, where I feel that, um, you know, the, the personal, you know, just the enjoyment outweighs the hassles. I mean, there's huge amounts of headaches and stress and, and, and hassles with any, you know, operation, um, especially a football team. You but get the respect from the crowd, you get the respect back, you feel like uh, you're still enjoying it? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, we have unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable fans. I mean, it's, it's very inspiring for sure. Um, and it's a shame right now, obviously, that nobody has fans for the most part um, in the stadiums, that is. But um, yeah, I mean, it has to do with uh, uh, having a vision for the club and how, how we play and how we do things and how we you know, run the organization as a whole, including the youth organization, and, um, and how we are actually doing that. And I think we still have a, you know, a little ways to go in that respect. Um, I'd like to see that happen. I'd like to see it through. I enjoy the challenge of trying to, to get there. But, you know, if I don't enjoy that anymore, um, that's probably when I will, will uh, think about uh, leaving. But I am enjoying it still, and, um, and I have no intentions of leaving. And are you watching all the games, Maccabi game? All the games, absolutely. The games. You can't even imagine. You can't even imagine some of the things that I'm that I'm doing. You know, when I'm watching the games, I, I can't even. I can't no, even. You can. To, you uh, can. You some, can. Sometimes, uh, you know, the, the last game I I did have. Um, it's crazy. I mean, last game, Beersheba or Haifa. Um, Beersheba, uh, the last game I watched, no, I watched uh, pretty much unimpeded the last game. But Haifa, I, wanted to be, I wanted to be next to you, Bacabi Haifa game. Penalty. Yeah. So, so Haifa, you know, I watched that game, but part of that game, I actually had to be on, you know, you know on something, you know, it was another Zoom call. And for the first part of the game, I actually had the game behind <laughs> the, 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 the Zoom call screen. And, you know, out of one eye, I was... Well, let's say this, I had maybe one eye on the Zoom call, but um, no, I'm, a, I'm an okay multitasker or dual tasker anyway, maybe not multitasker, um, but then the Zoom call ended and thank God, and I, uh, I could watch the game. I've watched our games in the craziest places, you can't even imagine. I'm not going to say, I'll probably, you know, 
I don't want to tell you because, um, but I never miss a game. And, um, and uh, I watch them alone for the most part. I really prefer to watch them alone. Um, and, uh, and so generally speaking, I, I and, you know, if I'm at the office, everybody just, you know, normally I have a stream of people outside my office, you know, and they come in and they just come in and they come in and everything's, you know, this problem, this fire, this fire. And then as soon as the game starts, you know, my door is still open, but suddenly like, there's nobody, nobody there. And sometimes I can, you know, you know, I react to something and they can, they all hear me in the office. They, they all follow the game, you know, in the, in the company, you know, there's, there's, you know, normal, there'd be, you know, 400 plus people in the office, all keeping their eye on, on the game. Are, are you satisfied with the level uh, this year of Maccabi? Do you think uh, you have a chance to win the title? You know, I actually like uh, the, the, the team a lot this year. You know, it's, it's, we've had teams where, you know, we've had just incredible results and you can't dispute the, um, you know, the talent and, you know, whatnot. And, um, and uh, you know, I love those teams too. But there is something about this team this year that I really like. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to you know, get into individuals and, you know, specifics, but uh, I very much am enjoying um, this year and this team. Uh, obviously, we're, we're not in first place and we're not running away with first place like we have in the past. But, um, you know, I'm very comfortable with where we are. So you, have a, you have a chance to win the championship. You always, you have a, you're a believer. Uh, we are not in uh, the soccer, the football you know. <laughs> business uh, to um, you know to 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 come second. I mean, we we don't uh, do this to be second. We don't go yes, we're right. we second. Um, so you know, uh, but we worry about ourselves. I mean, you know, we really worry about ourselves, and uh, we need to just focus on you know our. Um, you know, our work, you know, our, um, uh, you know, our goals uh, internal and uh, hopefully, you know, the results will look after themselves. I got to ask you something, Mitch, that I find it beautiful. And um, I think she's listening to us. I don't know if, uh, but what made you hire Sharon, which is a great woman, by the way, to such an important position as a CEO of the club? Do you think other teams will follow you and... Uh, give equal opportunity for women, like in such a masculine sport, you know, men's sport and this, like, it's unusual what you did. I think it's, I find it beautiful. You know, look at, I mean, unusual, it, it shouldn't be, it's, un, it's unusual that it's unusual. I mean, why is it remarkable uh, for a woman to be on the top of a, of a soccer? Or the first club? one, I, mean, I think. Um, okay, well, that's remarkable. Um, Sharon is, you know, we, we put Sharon as the uh, interim CEO um, without, you know, without hesitation. She is somebody we've worked with, um, uh, um, you know, for many years, uh, you know, on many, many, you know, projects. She's, uh, you know, she's just a hardworking, intelligent uh, woman who, who uh, cares about everything. Um, I mean, I don't think you could find a person who cares more about uh, her, her employer, you know, let's, let's say what it is, her employer, more than Sharon, uh, which is hard, you know, which is very important. You, you want to cultivate people who care. Like the care factor is, is the secret ingredient to, to business. You know, you can't watch everything all the time. And so uh, people are, look at big companies are not the problem, it's people who are the challenge. And if you can, if you can uh, work with people who care, have a high you know, care fact quotient, you, um, you will be more successful. And Sharon has that um, quality. And uh, so we're very proud of, of having Sharon um, uh, at the top of the management organization. And look at, I mean, I uh, don't find this, I, I don't know why this is remarkable anyway in Israel, you have uh, Golda Meir as a good example um, of a female at the top of your, uh, uh, your organization. Um, I find it beautiful, like just that you are the first one, and I'm, I, and I'm asking because you did things in soccer and in football, Israel, 
that people followed you. And if it was a technical uh, director or anything you did, people wanted to follow. Hopefully they will follow you with like putting a, a woman, like, you know, up yeah. there in the but Hopefully, hopefully uh, they do it based on merit. I mean, Sharon is uh, there because of merit. Um, uh, you know, and I uh, hope if there are other organizations that for whatever reason have not considered a woman for that position because they're a woman, then maybe, yeah, hopefully maybe this is just, look, it's sometimes we all need a little bit of a, you know, like a little bit of a reminder, a wake up call or a cold shower. I mean, you know, sometimes it's not with bad uh, reasons. Sometimes it's just old habits die hard. I don't know, but, um, but uh, you know, there's mathematically, you know, you'd think that there would be many more women at the top of every organization, um, um, including, you know, football. I will ask you, not mentioning names, <laughs> I don't, but uh, um, what are uh, your red lines? Um, I mean, you know, like something that you won't accept in your team. Something that you say, this well, is not. Red lines in business or leaking, from Maccabi Tel Aviv? Without leaking, mentioning names. Leaking, leaking. Yeah. Leaking. Leaking, leaking um, is, is a red line for sure. There's no tolerance for, for, for leaking. Um, sabotaging any, anybody, you know, on, in the family, um, in the organization, in any way. Um, you know, be it, um, you know, be it through leaking or be it through just psychologically. Um, uh, you know, um, um, you know, thinking, you know, or, or undermining the culture by, uh, you know, by, by uh, various means um, to, you know, that may come from feeling that you're more more uh, valuable than somebody else in the organization, you know, disrespect within the family, quite frankly, disrespect to anybody. Like we, we just don't stand for that. And I will not stand for that, whether it's in the club or outside on the street, um, it just will not be tolerated. Uh, these are red lines, um, um, work ethic related things. I mean, some people play close to the lines. Okay, but eventually it's a red line. Um, so yeah, those are, those are examples. And we can ask you gossip question. Sure. You want uh, you don't have to answer it, but he's a friend of mine. He's a good friend of mine. And I know you respect him around Zavi. Will you see him uh, finishing the career in Maccabi or you don't think it <laughs> happened? <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen, um, uh, you know, I love uh, Iran. We are, we are good friends. Uh, you know, we stay in touch. Um, and, uh, you know, other than, you know, other than um, you know, details and, uh, and life and, you know, there's a million, you know, c you know circumstances involved in, in uh, where a player is and where a player isn't. Um, why a player is on Maccabi, why a player is not on Maccabi. And, uh, but in general, you know, as a general idea, there's absolutely no reason why that couldn't happen. Um, there's no, you know, there's no, no issue. It's just circumstances. Um, and those are circumstances are, are, are reasons why things don't happen. Um, just specifics, you know, uh, contracts and timing and positions and, you know, financial things and, you know, but generally speaking, I mean, um, there's absolutely no, uh, in fact, quite the contrary. I mean, it would be, you know, there'd be, there'd be something, you know, poetic to have Iran back on, on Maccabi. Um, but, um, but, you know, it's unknowable whether or not, you know, that will happen. So don't go you know, interpreting this in any way, one way or the other. We're going to finish soon, obviously. I'm going to let you go play your squash soon. <laughs> you know, two more kills. <laughs> I know you're like, you want to go and play. You can't keep your day without the squash. But um, tell me, what makes you happier? See Maccabi qualifying for Champions League or close another huge deal? Real estate, Walmart or... <laughs> oh, no, 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 there's no question, no question. Maccabi, nothing. Really? To talk about. Oh my God, <laughs> nothing to talk about.
Zero. <laughs> zero, zero. It's a hundred zero. No question. Do you remember the feeling qualifying for the Champions League other in uh, Switzerland, I think it was, huh? the last minute? You remember yourself? Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, if you really want to, you want entertainment, you know, uh, speak to speak to the guys that were sitting beside me in those last minutes. Uh, Martin Bain. And you get uh, the same excitement and, uh, in business like you get it in sports. You know, they're very similar, to be honest with you. Um, you have to stay ahead of them. You have to be ahead. You cannot. You have to be driving, not being driven. Uh, but when you are, you know, when you do what you have to do to stay ahead of your business. Uh, you know, and as I say, pay forward, you know, play, you know, long-term, you know, long-term planning. Um, uh, they're very similar, you know, uh, you know, you feel alive, um, you know, uh, with both and uh, they're both incredible challenges and uh, you never get tired of them, um, you know, because it's like, it's like you, you know, does anyone ever ask you, Andy? You know why? Why are you playing another tennis game? I mean, you played so many already. Well, what you're going to play tennis again? You know, like people ask me, well, why do you keep doing business? You know, or why do you do Maccabi? I mean, this is living. You know, and so um, uh, they're very similar, actually, for me. I mean, now you seem to be so peaceful and uh, perfect in life, uh, but you must have some bad habits. Please, I mean, if oh. you don't mind, share with us a few of them. You know, like everything seems to be Mitch, Mr. Perfect. No, share, Mr. share with Perfect. us, oh share God. with us some bad habits. Oh my goodness, God, we should get a few. Yeah, wow. First of all, no, you know, <laughs> Mr. Perfect, no. Bad habits. I mean, sure. How how much time do we have here? We have as long as you want, as long as you want. People keep getting in. I put too much salt on my food. I mean, you know, I'm told, I'm told I use too much salt. Um, I, um, I'm very slow, uh, you know, I'm very slow typer. I'm very slow to, to, re to reply uh, to, to emails and texts. Very bad. Terrible. I, I, I'm, I'm just too, you know, slow and yeah, I just say, uh, so actually I've become a caller now. I, I decided it's easier to call. So um, um, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm uh, I don't know, I, uh, bad habits. Um, uh, I'm a bit, uh -huh. uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm sort of a bit of a, you know, kind of a, mm, Maybe a bit of a you know loner in a way, like I sort of am a more not so so social. So maybe you could say <laughs> that's not my 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 greatest quality. You know, um, um, I'm not so superstitious, but I have a few superstitions. Like um, you know, um, uh, it's kind of embarrassing, but um, I guess um, uh, I don't know when I started doing this, but I always carry you know, a pen in my right pocket. You know, I don't know where this happened and somewhere back way in. I always carry one superstitious about that. I have some superstitious. I'm not superstitious, but I have a kind no. of funny one. You are very um, superstitious. Not superstitious, very superstitious. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I become a little bit more with uh, with certain things, but um, but it uh, doesn't, uh, it's not a big, big part of me, big part of my life. Um, yeah, I don't know. I have lots of bad habits. Um, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna think about it. Maybe before we hang up, I'll give you a few better ones. You know, more juicy ones. <laughs> I'll call you after we finish this one. You want me to go through a few questions that people keep sending me and make me crazy, or you just want to? Sure, think sure, sure, yeah, sure. Because I got like, listen, I never got my phone so many text messages. Oh my god. People are kidding me. When I won Wimbledon, I wasn't. I'm sure they're all asking the same question, probably. Everybody so. is asking the same question. Atili and me, everybody, 100 messages asking about them. They're going to come back. No, yes, why, how, that, why did they kick them out? You can't even imagine my phone. You can't even imagine. <laughs> oh my God. This is one question to ask me. The other one to ask me about stadiums. Are you going to build a stadium or not? Are you happy with Bloomfield or not? Uh, what do you think? Well, I mean, I guess, uh, I mean, there is merit to building a proper Maccabi, you know, 
training facility and stadium. Uh, there is merit for that um, in general, you know. Um, so we'll see, it's possible. Um, you know, we continue to uh, consider this as a possibility, but I mean, the municipality did do, did do a good job um, with Bloomfield and thankfully it's, it's finally, you know, completed, although unfortunately we can't uh, enjoy it right now. And, um, you know, we did come to terms with the municipality, uh, which is great. Um, so we, I think, have good relations with the municipality and, and so we don't feel the same urgency to build a new stadium, though, you know, long term, it may make sense. Um, and also a training facility, um, a, a proper, you know, better training facility for all the for all the age groups, including, of course, the first team. So this is something we continue to to look out uh, to look for. But we're sort of content with with Bloomfield at the moment. Nice, nice, nice. So people here, hey, Atzeli Mich, Atzeli Mich, making crazy man. Hey, um, MMM about the youth uh, department. Are you involved with the youth department? Are you you know some youth players that coming and growing up into like the men team? The you know. And look at the, the key to our are you invest are you investing in the youth club you believe in it absolutely no no the youth department is uh the key to the club i mean there's nothing to talk about um it's it's just uh plain and simple i mean for all kinds of reasons um so yes i uh feel good about um about investing in the youth uh department and I am involved in the uh, in the youth program. You know, uh, when Pat Patrick was there, you know, full time, we would talk about all the the list of initiatives that we we need. We're a long way. I mean, we're a long way from where we should be with our youth program. We can be much better than we are. We are going to be much better than we are. Um, but uh, we uh, have come a long way too. Um, but it is our future for sure much more so than it was in my early days, my early years. I wanted to get to the youth in the early days, but there were just too many, too many fires and too many priorities with the, uh, with everything, you know, inside, you know, the, I mean, just, but, but in the last number of years, we've finally been allocating the appropriate amount of time and, and effort and money to the youth. Um, so it's starting to really show, but we've got a long way to go. Some people are asking here, when are you going to make Aliyah? and meet a nice Israeli woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, good, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, my mother would probably be asked the same question. Did my mother uh, send that question? Um, the, um, <laughs> uh, you know, when I bought Maccabi, it's a long story, I won't start now, but you know, I used, to, I used to teach at the University of Toronto and I enjoyed it very much. And then when I bought Maccabi, I stopped teaching there for a while because I couldn't really, uh, I needed the time for, for Maccabi. The, the, the class took up a lot of time. It was once a week. So anyway, um, uh, when I bought Maccabi, I really, business was really kind of sailing along. And I thought maybe, maybe I could spend start by spending half a year in Israel. Uh, that was in my original plan, actually. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know, I guess the financial crisis came and uh, um, I don't know, I, 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 I just traveled back and forth a lot more than, than I guess uh, I just traveled more because I had to. Um, and I, at the moment, don't know whether I will uh, ever you know, permanently move to Israel. You know, sometimes I think about it, but I've, really? you know, I have wow. my life in Canada, my family in Canada, my business in Canada, which I enjoy very much. And normally, I mean, I can come to Israel regularly, um, but maybe as when I get older, you know, um, you know, if I still own Maccabi, you know, and if I was not in my, my core business, it'd be well into the future. You know, maybe I would, you know, who knows? Whenever I beat you in squash, you can come here. Before that, no. So. Yeah. <laughs> when, well, you when, get you... Like, when you get to 80, 90. 
<laughs> if you, oh if my you God. Me in squash, I'm trying to think. Let's... I may be, uh, I, I may, I, I'll think about it. I may actually commit to Alia if you beat me in squash, but um, uh, I don't know. You no, can no. practice. I, I know Levy is training ping, uh, ping pong behind, <laughs> behind our back. And you know, and you may start training squash behind my back. So I don't know. I don't want to make any uh, yeah. any strong statements on that. Another question here is about the oh the fair play. I mean, Maccabi had some problems with the fair play rule in the past. Do you think a team from Israel can compete with the team from Europe? Like even you know? To be honest with you, I think it's uh, it's difficult. I mean. Because of the rules, um, you know, um, in Israel, because of the rules instituted, uh, it is difficult for an Israeli team to to thrive, let's just say, uh, consistently in Europe. Um, they have 350 million people to choose from. We have 9 million people to choose from. Um, you know, uh, budget-wise, I don't need to tell you. So... With the five on the field rule, six on the club, you know, foreigner rule, um, it is difficult. Uh, so it's a negative vicious circle um, uh, because then we don't, if we, we, when I say we, all of us in the Israeli premiership um, don't excel in Europe, then of course we have to adjust our budgets. And by adjusting our budgets, of course, we probably will have you know, difficulty or challenges competing in Europe. So it's a bit of a fine line, um, but I would say net net uh, is um, a current environment, yeah, difficult for an Israeli team to consistently excel in Europe. But it's pretty exciting when we do. As underdogs, I mean, to be honest with you, uh, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one who would say that it's, it's pretty cool when we do excel. You know, little Israel, where there are nine million, and uh, you know, taking on you know, the bigger clubs in 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 in, um, in, in Europe. So, um, um, so we, we get a little extra, we get a little extra, uh, you know, um, joy, uh, naches from from <laughs> the successes that we do have. Yeah. Another one is asking you if uh, what about reinforcing the team this year? It's going to happen or? First of all, I feel like the team, we have been reinforcing ourselves um, just in a kind of sort of step-by-step, -step, you know, transformational way, just internally. Um, so I think that it's, um, you know, our own, the chemistry of our, of our team has been able to change itself, which is, uh, I think, being quite, you know, amazing to watch. Uh, but we're always on the lookout for opportunities to fill in some some holes where we feel we really can't. And so, yes, we're we're open to that. But it is background music. I mean, it's not the foreground music. Um, uh, we see this for the most part to be, uh, you know, the the squad to take us, you know, to the end. All right. I tell you, people keep writing me. You are the best. You are amazing. You are. Like you can't even imagine. I know, like you know, Maccabi, Betar, Paul. There's so, the rivalry and the hateness in, in in soccer, in sports. And I really, you, you are like everybody. You know, I get so many positive messages about you from like you know Maccabi Haifa fans, Paul, Betar. I mean, there is something new you brought into soccer, uh, something different with uh, different style. And uh, this is something that I, I know, like lots of people know how to appreciate it. And uh, know how to appreciate you involving the Israeli soccer, investing in Israeli soccer, the way you talk, our our country, our like you are so involved with Israel, your passion about Maccabi. I mean, there's no doubt. Everybody know how to appreciate. I get hundreds of messages, Mitch, and I know the people here that they are listening. I, I didn't open the the microphone and the the thing for questions because you know the first question what is gonna be, and I didn't want to go there. But I mean, I know, I think they know by the way you talk, what you think and your visions and everything. I mean, we couldn't ask for better. We are, I mean, really, Mitch, thank you so much for, for being here, for being in Israel, investing, uh, being our friend. And uh, I mean, couldn't thank you more. And just stay here for long. And 
What can I say? Maccabi, Maccabi. We're going to still suffer in Betar. <laughs> well, I don't want to reveal any secrets. If you want to But talk if you about have anything to finish with, Mitch, is, I mean, it's yours, you know? So. Yeah, I mean, just, um, you know, appreciate uh, you doing this for, I guess, you know, you do this for your class. I used to yeah. do a class too. I think it's great that you do it. Um, I remember the kind of when the world, uh, the world works when people do things like this works better um so you know i tell you the reason uh, i tell you the reason and it's important for me to say it here the reason i'm studying uh, sports and education here in kiraton and it's something new there they started a couple of years ago and i'm involved with it i want to change like the mentality of sports in israel through education more educated people to get into sports to managers jobs and you know here people like you doing it big it's going to change sports in israel and my, there's the one question here that somebody asked me, ask Mitch what he thinks about sports in Israel, soccer in Israel, and how we can change, what can we do different? So, I mean, this is why the reason I'm here, you know, like I want to change, I want, you know, be a part of good thing and good change. And like you say, it's going to take a long time, but the people here, there are a lot of good people here that are looking at you, listening. And this is how we start, good education, the different mentality, and we can do it right, I think, with lots of people like you. So, you know? Yeah, well, I want to say, actually, I mean, I know that every, most people know you in Israel, but I mean, um, honestly, I really hope that, that, you know, someday you do get into a position um, of, you know, increase and increase and increase visibility, because I swear to God, I'm not, I mean, you know, the sun is always shining in your world, my friend, you are just, you know, one of the most positive, you know, uh, decent humans out there. And, um, and, you know, to the extent that you can, you know, influence, you know, more, the more people you influence, the better. And so obviously I wish you all the best of luck with all, with all that. And if I can be of any help um, at any time along the way, I'm, I'm here. Thanks, Michi. Guys, good night, everybody. Thank you for being with us. Michi, we'll talk soon. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Laila, so. All right. Bye.